Birth has been a part of a woman's life since the beginning of time, but we need to have a rebirth where it comes to how we understand women and their fertility. So I'm gonna begin with three different mantras and we're gonna just feel the difference. I would like to make my body a welcoming home for new life versus I'm doing everything perfectly to achieve pregnancy. And then hmm, not pregnant again this month. I trust that my body knows best. I'm going to continue to nurture her and perhaps she'll feel ready in the coming months versus my body's betraying me. Something is wrong with me. And then I'm beginning a mysterious journey. And with every step I practice letting go of my illusion of control, my body and my intentions are an invitation to life. And at that same time, I understand something far beyond my own or any physician's awareness is at play. Versus it's entirely up to me and my doctor to get this body pregnant. We are in full control of this matter. So I began with contrasting these three different mantras because the three areas of focus I have for today are invitation, body trust, and acceptance of the mystery. Now, there may be some people sort of chomping at the bit wanting to know how acupuncture and Chinese medicine can medically contribute to fertility. So let me quickly run through this list. It can regulate hormones, normalize in a regular period, optimize egg and sperm quality and sperm count, improve ovulation, help to clear out minor scar tissue blockages, thicken the lining of your uterus for implantation, help the body retain pregnancy, help mitigate the symptoms of pregnancy or help to deal with um, maybe an ailment where you'd normally use um, a medicine that you either can't while pregnant or you'd rather not. Uh, it helps improve lactation once baby has arrived and it helps mama get her blood and energy back now that she's delivered and is literally giving everything of herself to this new life and sleeplessly at that. So interestingly though, as important and extensive as that list is, I've still found that that whole list is secondary to the reframes I started with. Women come in to see us for fertility who have already been told that they have to achieve pregnancy or that their body is broken or that the outcome is entirely up to their body or the clinic they're working with. And other than that being like sort of just a callous approach, the problem with that is that it puts the body in stress. And a woman's body in stress does not want to get pregnant. So Contrasting that with, I'd like to invite life. I trust my body. I accept the mystery. That approach brings calm and joy and consciousness to the journey. So we've all heard of the, the phrase rest and digest as a reference to the parasympathetic nervous system, but really what it should be called is rest, digest, and be fertile. Because if your body is getting constant messages passed down from the nervous system that it's under threat, whether it's physical, emotional, or any other way, your body will protect you from conceiving. So it's not you getting, getting betrayed or being betrayed by your body. Your body's actually protecting you. So that long list of benefits that I listed above is completely eclipsed by acupuncture and Chinese medicine's ability to calm the nervous system and to help it to return to and exist primarily in that parasympathetic rest, digest, and be fertile mode. So now that we've kind of reframed that approach to getting pregnant, how about a reframe for your body and how you relate to it? And this can be so difficult if you've experienced month after month with no positive pregnancy test or you've experienced repeated miscarriages. It can be devastating, absolutely devastating. And that coupled with our inborn human negative bias, we begin to think that we're broken or assume that we're incapable. But there's another truth. Your body is innately wise and wants nothing but to protect you and to bring forth new life. 
That's what it was built to do. So I even just want to pause for a second and marvel at how magical the female body is. It is born with innate and detailed wisdom around fertility. It has the gift of being connected to mother nature and her cycles. A woman has the ability to create, grow, feed, nurture, and give birth to life itself. But sadly, you know, it's been many thousands of years and I feel that we're coming out of it, but there's been systematic disempowering of women and we've been disconnected intentionally from our magic and our, the fact that we're creatresses. We've been taught things like that our period is gross and it should be hidden away instead of inspected and used as our fifth vital sign. Instead of being taught fertility awareness, we are given synthetic hormones to manage our fertility. And women need to know that there is a billion dollar, there are billion dollars, plural industries, which benefit from making you forget that you were born fertile and magical. A woman must remember that her body was built for pregnancy. And many of the presenting issues showing up as infertility have more to do with the current conditions we live under. We live under too much stress. We're exposed to man-made chemicals. We have nutritional deficiencies. And so a woman's body thinks better of conceiving because the conditions aren't good. And yet we punish our bodies, we hate on our bodies for suffering these consequences. So on this journey, we have to remember that the body has not failed us and we haven't failed. Which brings me to this third piece of the mystery and the letting go. So the bulk of the fertility journey is a lot of sitting in darkness and mystery and feeling out of control. And this may sound totally miserable, but it's good because it's practice. The fact is that once you, the second half of every woman's cycle is deeply mysterious, whether you want to achieve pregnancy or you don't. You have to sit in wonder and darkness and a lack of control about whether your life is about to completely change or not. And that's an opportunity to practice this conscious letting go of control. And then if you do get that positive test, you've got this period of time when you're waiting to find out is this embryo viable? Will it have a heartbeat? That feels like eons. Another opportunity to practice, practice sitting in the darkness and the mystery and the letting go of control. And then there's that notorious three month mark we wait for, you know, to see if that pregnancy is going to stick. And that feels like an eternity. And then we let our guards down a little bit. But the truth is we don't really know even at that point because there's the old adage, every apple seed is not going to become an apple tree. And so we've already begun as mothers to live with the fear, the deep, deep fear of losing our young. And then once they're outside of our bodies, the opportunity to practice implementing this consciousness is so important. The managing of the fear and anxiety about our little one getting hurt or losing them, because I'm here to tell you, it will consume you if you don't. And it's just not fair to our children to live in that space. We, we, we really must incorporate a practice of mindfulness around this process of the, the mystery and letting go, even all the while that we're holding on tight. So you may be thinking like, this sounds like anything but joy. But the thing, the, the thing is, we have to say out loud what we feel. And any woman who is aware of her emotions knows that even if it lurks deep beneath the surface, this fear is immense and it feels like it can take you down. But what's exciting about speaking it and relating to it and practicing getting used to darkness, mystery and letting go 
is that that is going to make you a much more conscious parent. And I can't think of any kind of better parent than one who is in the process of awakening and becoming more and more conscious. So with this last minute, I just wanna run through some practical tips here. Um, of course, get acupuncture. As I said before, super effective. We need to get enough sleep, get quality food, manage our stress, meditate if possible, and keep it fun versus technical. There are a couple of resources that I thought it would be worthwhile to mention, um, but we'll put them in the liner notes below. All right. Um, not to go directly at the heart of it all, but the question that I was really contemplating is, what are the messages that you received about mothering and sexuality in your body and your period when you were growing up? Maybe that's better to be general too. I mean, what, what messages did you hear that were being taught to you and your peers? Well, having had a few issues growing up around um, fertility organs, I was taught very early that, that I have no control you know, like, and, and I know that sounds ironic because we're talking about letting go of control, but that my body didn't have the innate wisdom that it needed mm -hmm. and that medical intervention was needed and I needed to be cut on and given this chemical. And with what I know now, that was absolutely unnecessary. And I have lifelong, you know, scar tissue con consequences because I didn't know better, you know, so I didn't, you know, I grew up in a, a household of women, so it wasn't like I so much felt like in my own house I needed to hide that this, but I very much just am aware. It's like it's like it just seeps through the walls, right? Um, mm -hmm. The whole internalized women's oppression thing, like it's just everywhere you look. So had somebody told me when I was getting my first period, or maybe even a little bit before that, that I have a magical body that was built with this innate wisdom and was capable of so much. And here's the ways you're going to be aware of your cycle and what it's telling you, because there are messages, you know, the whole time, not just when you're bleeding, we're getting these messages from our bodies, you know, and if we knew how to read those signs, I mean, it's, it's so enabling and empowering. Yeah. I just, I immediately had this uh, like memories, you know, when being in sixth grade and of course there were some of the girls in class that would start bleeding and, you know, like, I just don't know if we had enough, if the, if the as a guy, like we didn't have enough framework around that to help us understand it. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's an embarrassing process because we don't have those cultural, the cultural scaffolding to say, this is what happens, this is what goes on, this is, how, you know, because of the repressive, like, let's hide it. I think one, one, one woman I was talking to at one point was, was kind of initiating a younger girl who had just started her period. And she was like, look at all these girls on the high school campus. There are many of them that are having their periods right now. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's fine. It's not something that you can still react or interact in the world, but there, I, I just think I'm very sensitive to, to that, that anxiety that people feel around these natural, I like your term, the magic. I think that that would be a lot cooler. You and I've talked about that a lot though, the magic of it. Yeah. yeah but think about how unceremonious most women's, um, transition into womanhood is I mean it's like oh oh okay are you in pain do you need an Advil here's a pad or tampon whichever you're ready for do you not use this like it's very <laughs> unceremonious medicalized yeah and so it's unfortunate you know that's the really a, a wonderful opportunity to introduce um the divine feminine to a young woman how would you do that how do you propose that uh we do that Right. Well, I mean, I'm just imagining like if I could go back in time and, and write my own script. So I'm projecting, obviously, but, you know, I can imagine drawing her a bath and putting rose petals in it and lighting candles and explaining to her what's going on, you know, 
physically, physiologically, what's happening to her. We would have probably given her some heads up that it was coming soon, but you know, maybe in more detail. If it was a school day, I got to tell you, I wouldn't have her go to school. Like mine happened on a school day and it was like I was dropped off. And even though I probably was wearing a light day pad at the time, it felt like I was wearing a giant diaper. You know what I mean? Like you're just, you don't know who you are on that day. You know, you're becoming somebody else. And so hmm. I need a minute, you know, I just need a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, don't want to go to science class or history class the day I become a woman. Or PE. <laughs> <laughs> God sounds miserable. That whole thing sounds acting as if this thing isn't happening when it's happening and it's supercharged. I mean that. And and also the crazy thing is for men, men don't have those kinds of um, opportunities, you know, to connect with a biological marker of a transition. You know, they're kind of created out there or through ritual. And and so if men also need to understand that, you know, I, as, as you're talking, I'm thinking like, what are the conversations to have with boys too about, you know, what is that? Because we really need to be doing all of it so that when young girls are walking through and, you know, they're supported in that process rather than, um, you know, ridiculed or they're embarrassed by it. Yeah. You know, and, and then, of course, you know, the moms themselves would have to know, but I, ref I referenced the fifth vital sign earlier and to bring some context to that. So vital signs are what, you know, when you're being triaged or, or seen by your physician, they'll take your temperature, check your blood pressure, check your heart rate, et cetera. These are evidences of whether or not your body's under too much stress. And women are blessed with this fifth one, which is our cycles. Uh-huh. Wow. So if, if they could be, you know, initiated into, okay, here's what you're going to be looking for. And when that's not what you see, it's an indication that you're under too much stress, you know, and, and you get to figure out, you get to analyze and be curious. Like, is that emotional stress? Is that physical stress? Is it both? Am I living in a house or in a community that's got too much exposure to chemicals that my body was not made to accommodate? It brings up the, the the other thing. I wrote down a lot of things, um, but when you were going through that list of how acupuncture and Chinese medicine can support the body, that was an impressive list. Right. I mean, I live with you, and I was like, "Holy moly!" Like that to hear that all encapsulated. And we talk about this stuff all the time, but it's like that—that's radical to think about. Yeah. And it should. Yeah. And you know, for anybody watching this, you know, I get to hear. Leela Scott's stories about when that happens in her in her practice, and and that I mean, there's we are in these laboratories, you know, where there's hardcore verifiable evidence that these kinds of approaches um, do do uh, a result is you know a, a, a thickening of the lining, like <laughs> wow, right? Well, and and when you say when that happens, the context to that is when I come home and say. Mm, somebody who hasn't ovulated in months ovulated on her own for the first time, right. you know, after this many sessions or somebody who had repeated miscarriages is now carrying or, right. you know, there's any number of things you've heard me say that um, just show. I, I, and I guess I, you know, I've seen that book around the fifth vital sign and to hear what that means and to hear it in that is, a, I mean, that, that is a fascinating measurable um, aspect of, of the work, you know, so often the, the way that I work is a lot of subjectivity, you know, like, how's your sense of well being? Well, I'm, you know, I'm, it, it's in, a, it's in a world of kind of immeasurable qualitative mm -hmm. um, dynamics, as opposed to, you know, when you are working with the female body, there are these kind of literal measurable, identifiable, uh, seasonal, like psych cyclical um, aspects of the body. Wow. Right. Well, and the other piece too, that's important to mention is that I can't tell you how many people come in and they're, you know, we're, we're talking about her cycle and all these like details about it. And I'll say, what about pain? Do you have any pain? Well, yeah, but that's normal because everyone around them suffers pain. I myself used to suffer tremendous pain. You know, it's not normal. It's not normal for your cycle to hurt. 
that means that something is out of balance and we can fix that, you well, know? Riff, riff on that for a second. What might that mean if, if a cycle hurts? Well, it gets a little bit off into the actual, you know, physiology of Chinese medicine, but it would more than likely mean, although you really have to work with somebody intimately to be very specific about what it means, but generally what it probably means is that they have something called liver chi stagnation, which chi meaning vital energy, um, that's, that's as close of a translation as we can come up with so that the liver essentially is, which is responsible for this free flow of energy in your body. So there's not this like stuckness feeling. Well, when it's time to cycle, right? Like normally your, your uterus should be able to, to kind of contract and shed. And that's not a painful process. It's just doing this shedding process very smoothly and painlessly. But if our liver chi, our liver energy is backed up or the liver is unable to do its job because of all these stressors, it's having to process all these other stressors, you will experience the pain. So we would go about soothing the liver, restoring that free flow of energy and it's paired organ is gallbladder. I'm trying to feel like how deep to go into this, but rabbit tree, yeah. Right. Gallbladder is very important in the, the muscle tendon ligament tone. And mm-hmm. so by restoring the health of the liver, that because of course it's a muscle, right? It's, the uterus is lined in muscle. So it would also for that reason improve. Well, and it brings up uh, the the other one of the other things I, I wrote down. It's sad. It's a sad aspect of our language, which is, you know, a pregnancy is either positive or negative, and we those are such loaded concepts with you know good and bad. It becomes a moral mm-hmm. issue, and even yeah. as you're saying that, like, I wonder if there's somebody listening or or even that's not, but just this this as a reality when a when a cycle does hurt how quickly somebody probably moves into something is wrong this is not good my you know back to your i loved your mom you know the body is failing me Mm -hmm. and and, you know i i I just wonder how you well through that this is important for you to know as a therapist who works with women that 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 pain of this cycle really cycles back into hatred of self, hatred of being a woman. So they've got that all coming at them from the women's oppression stuff that we talked about seeping in through the walls. And then it has to hurt for me to cycle. Are you kidding me? And I want to be pregnant and it's not happening for me. I hate myself. I am a woman and I'm broken. This is awful. You know, it's just, it compounds the issue tremendously. Thank you. Hopefully there've been lots of takeaways today so that you can engage with your body, start to be curious about your body. And um, there's also a lot of, you know, medical stuff uh, about being a woman that acupuncture and Chinese medicine could possibly help you with. So hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I guess this was section four of our Renaissance series and uh, please reach out to us if you have further questions about your own fertility um, or just pain with your cycles and and fertility really where it comes to either wanting to get pregnant or wanting to avoid pregnancy this this information remains true regardless of, of your preference so thanks